Good morning, welcome to our Srimad Bhagavatam classes, which we hold every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at uh, 7.30 a.m. out of Spanish for Utah, which is Mountain Daylight Time. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, and our verse is from the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, <clears throat> second chapter, fourth verse. O maganati marandasyang garangana sarakya chaksuru and miritam yena tajmai sri gurave namaha. Si chaitanya manovistam stapitam yena bhutare sayam rupakara mayam tarati sa parantikam. Vandeham si guru siyata parakamanam si guru and vaishnavam scha. Si rupam sagadatam sahagana raganatam bitam stam sadevam. Sadvaitam savadutam parijana saitam krishna chaitanya devam. Si radha krishna padan sahagana ladita si visakan bitam scha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutade Shimadi Bhaktivedanta Swami Tanamani. Namaste Sarasati Deva Guravani Pacharin in Urvishes Sunyavadi Paskata De Satarin. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Kalada Shivasati Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari. <coughs> Good morning Anjali. Good morning Joe. Vai Bhabi. Yeah. If you're following along on a, in a book or on your phone, it's the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, second chapter, fourth verse. And this is a verse that whenever there's a Bhagavatam class given anywhere in the world in any of the 800 ISKCON temples, this is one of three verses which is pretty much required to be chanted. Good morning, Govinda Dev. Hare Krishna. Narayanam namaskritam, naram chevananotamam, devim sarasatim vyasam, tito jayo adhyaraya. The translation. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances under the personality of Godhead Narayan, under Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, under Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and under Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Prabhupada's purport, all the Vedic literatures and Puranas are meant for conquering the darkest region of material existence. The living being is in the state of forgetfulness of his relationship with God due to his being overly attracted to material sense gratification from time immemorial. His struggle for existence in the material world is perpetual and it is not possible for him to get out of it by making plans. If he at all wants to conquer this perpetual struggle for existence, he must reestablish his eternal relation with God. And one who wants to adopt such remedial measures must take shelter of literatures such as the Vedas and Puranas. Foolish people say the Puranas have no connection with the Vedas. However, the Puranas <clears throat> are supplementary explanations of the Vedas intended for different types of men. All men are not equal. There are men who are conducted by the mode of goodness, others who are under the mode of passion, and others who are under the mode of ignorance. The Puranas are so divided that any class of men can take advantage of them and gradually regain their lost position and get out of the hard struggle for existence. So right away, Prabhupada's saying that if you want to get out of the perpetual struggle for existence, you have to reestablish your connection with God. And of course, we know you have to chant your japa, you have to take prasadam. But he also says that you have to take advantage of literatures like the Puranas, and like the Srimad Bhagavatam, like the Bhagavad Gita. So there are, since Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the six Goswamis, who were extremely literary, extremely learned, Lord Chaitanya's followers, the Goswamis, wrote hundreds and hundreds of books about the science of Krishna consciousness. But after Lord Chaitanya and the six Goswamis, things deteriorated for a couple hundred years to the point where the Vaishnavas, such as they were, were sahajas, simply sentimentalists, and not only did they not take advantage of the literatures, but they thought that those who were scholarly, who did read the literatures, who did make commentaries, were mixed. <laughs> Can you imagine? They thought they were mixed Vaishnavas, not as high as the sentimentalists. I just heard the other day, someone told me that when Bhakti Mano Thakur, uh, this is the 1800s, became curious to read the Srimad Bhagavatam. He couldn't, it took him months before he could even find a copy of the Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So Vaishnavism without literature, without the Vedas and the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita is not Vaishnavism at all. Prabhupada said, without the literature, it's just sentiment, and that becomes fanaticism. Of course, just reading the literature without the sentiment is just dry philosophical speculation. So the literature is required, and the Puranas are conveniently divided, 18 Puranas conveniently divided uh, into those in the mode of, for those in the mode of ignorance, for those in the mode of passion, and for those in the mode of goodness. So at whatever level one is, one can find literature which will take one uh, higher, up to the next level. And of all the Puranas, the Bhagavatam is called the spotless Purana. In other words, it's even above the modes of goodness. Another prerequisite for getting out of the perpetual struggle for existence is to rise above the three gunas, or the three modes of material nature. They are goodness, passion, and ignorance. Uh, <clears throat> in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, trigunya visha veda, visha means poison, trigunya means three, trigunya, three guna, the three ropes, guna means ropes, the three ropes that bind us to this material world uh, are basically poison for the eternal spirit soul. Uh, Krishna encourages Arjuna to become free of the delusion and duality which are even found there in the Vedas themselves and rise to the level of Brahman. So in the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, just prior to this verse, when Sutta Goswami arrived before the sages at Nemesharanya, they were trying a few things. They were doing a fire sacrifice. They were chanting. They were conversant with scriptures. But they wanted to streamline their process. They wanted to get to the heart of the matter. And so therefore, their really uh, first question of Sutta Goswami, Bhūdini, Bhūdini, Kāmini, Srotya Vyāni, Vibhag, Atā Sadya Saram, Samudraya Minisya, Bruhi Padraya Bhūtaram, Yayatma Shūprasīdhati. Bruhi Bornini Kamini means there's so many scriptures, uh, and in these scriptures there are so many duties. And these duties, in the, the, according to the scriptures, they say this, these duties must be done, otherwise you'll not get spiritual advancement. And then another scripture will say, well, these duties must be done. And another scripture will say, well, these duties must be done, or this demigod must be worshipped, or this demigod must be worshipped. See what I mean? And the thing is, uh, even, if you, even if you knew how to do all those different duties and all, uh, even if you had the time to do them, which none of us do, uh, we don't live for thousands of years, the, many of the duties are, appear to be contradictory. Uh, one of our members of our Indian community once asked me, Chiru, there are 33 million gods. How, how can I satisfy all of them? And she was actually in anxiety. <laughs> she was actually tense because of the impossibility of doing all of those duties Satis propitiating all those deities, and some of which are actually contradictory. So it means that, you know, if you're doing one duty, then you might be, feel guilty about doing, not doing another duty. But even if you're doing them both, you might still feel guilty because they might seem contradictory. So the sages are saying to Sudha Goswami, the waters are muddy. The waters are muddy. So can you just give us the saram? Can you give us the essence of all those scriptures and explain it for the good of all living beings? Because we, in Kali Yuga, we don't have that much time. We need to make our time count if we're going to be successful in the short 160, 70 years that we have. And then it's also explained that in doing so, uh, Sutta Goswami would be doing a great good for all living beings. And uh, if you give the heart of religion, that also satisfies our hearts as well, unlike any sort of material arrangement. Prabhupada says here that it is understood that a Vaishnava should be completely conversant with Vaishnava philosophy. And this is a repudiation of the Vaishnava sahajas who eschew philosophy and look down upon those Vaishnavas who worship Krishna with their mind and their intelligence and their intellect. Prabhupada says, yet he should not think that studying Vedas is all in all and therefore be unattached to the chanting of the Holy Name. Prabhupada says one should 
study the Vedas, at least from the direct and not the indirect point of view. In the Bhagavad Gita himself, Krishna says, Rishibhu Bahudas Gitam Chandu Bhirvivira Brahma Sutta Padas Chaiva Hetu Madvir Vinistita. Krishna himself refers to the Brahma Sutras, the Vedas, and with all reasoning and argument. Now, sentiment is definitely a part of Vaishnavism. When we chant Hare Krishna, we're washed away uh, with the sentiment of love of God. But that sentiment has to be based on solid, fundamental philosophy, which comes from the Vedas. Prabhupada says here, in the Gaudiya Sampradaya, that means our line of disciplic succession, which comes from Gauda Desh, which is Bengal, and that's where Lord Chaitanya took his birth 500 years ago. There is a Vedantic commentary called the Govinda Basya, but the Sahajas consider such commentaries to be untouchable philosophical speculation, and they consider the Acharyas to be mixed devotees, thus they clear their way to hellish conditions. Krishna himself says, Acharya mam viganayat nam mam chit. Krishna says, the Acharya, one who worships me by chanting and preaching on the basis of revealed scriptures, mam viganayat. Krishna says, the Acharya is to be accepted as my very self. So imagine the lamentable condition of these so-called uh, uh, sahajas who insult and demean the position of the acharyas. <clears throat> Krishna himself says in the 15th chapter, 15th verse of the Bhagavad Gita, Vedas cha sarvir aham eva vedyo vidanta krit veda vid eva chaham. By all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the compiler of Vedanta and I am the knower of the Vedas. So someone might recall the incident in Benares when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came into a hall which was filled with Mayavadi or impersonal philosophers headed up by Prakasananda Saraswati. Lord Chaitanya had been in Benares for some time chanting in the streets and uh, the sannyasis themselves had heard about Lord Chaitanya and deemed him to be a sahaja, a sentimentalist. Uh, the sahajas were the status quo pretty much prior to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and after him also when things degraded. And so um, they asked him, why don't you study Vedanta? That's what sannyasis did in those days. They spent all their days studying the Vedas. And Lord Chaitanya answered, Mukatumi tomara nahik vedantikara krishna mantra japasara e mantra shara. So the first thing he said was that my spiritual master called me as a fool. So he's, he's making a very good point here. That one cannot become free of the perpetual struggle for existence without a guide, without a spiritual master. And we've always talked about the sentimentalist disregard, the position of the acharyas and the spiritual master. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is mentioning that the first and foremost principle is to take the instructions from the spiritual master. And he will instruct you according to time, place, and circumstances. The spiritual master is one who is very experienced in the preaching, in the assimilation, and the spreading of Bhagavad Dharma, Krishna consciousness. And so he will give you the exact instructions which are correct according to time, place, and circumstances. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, my spiritual master said, Murka tumi tomara nahik adandakara, you're not qualified to study Vedanta, and therefore Krishna Mantra Japa Sada, Sada means always, Krishna Mantra Japa, when we chant on our beads, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, that's called Japa. He said one should always chant Japa on one beads, and it says, this in fact is the essence of all mantras or Vedic hymns. And remember the Sages in Name Sharani asked Sutta Gosh, Deva Goswami, Sutta Goswami, what is the saram, what is the essence? And so that's also reflected here in Lord Chaitanya's answer to Chaitanya um, uh, Prakasananda Saraswati. It says, Krishna mantra japa shara, uh, e mantra shara. Again, the word sa meaning essence. That is the essence of all Vedas. Now, what's interesting is that. Right after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
quoted his spiritual master to Prakasananda Saraswati that you are not qualified to study the Vedas. You should just chant Hare Krishna. Soon thereafter, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gets a challenge from the Mayavadi sannyasis, and here's what they say to Lord Chaitanya. Now let us see how you can describe the sutras in terms of their direct meaning. They ask Lord Chaitanya, so you don't study the Vedas then? You're just, you just sentimentally chant Hare Krishna? He says, no, I study the Vedas, but I study the direct meaning of the Vedas. Whereas you guys, you, you take the Vedas, which, whose purpose is to bring you to the lotus feet of Krishna, you take the Vedas and you spin out an indirect meaning, you mislead yourselves and you mislead others. You take people through the Vedas, you take people away from the goal of the Vedas, which is Krishna Bhakti. And basically they're saying to Lord Chaitanya, well, you think you're so smart then go ahead and give us the direct meaning of the Vedas. So he's directly challenged to reveal Krishna from the Vedas based on his knowledge of the Vedas. So hearing this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began his direct explanation of Vedanta Sutra. Now, if you get time today, go to Chaitanya Charamrita, Adi Lila, because there's a, a number of verses which Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spun out of his mouth. And the nectar is unbelievable. It's un this is what converted all of those impersonal sannyasis. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu giving the direct Krishna bhakti right from Vedic conclusions. And these are just a couple of the verses here. And you'll see how nectarine they are compared to the indirect, philosophical, dry, mental, speculative process. This is like mango. This is like relishable mango. Lord Chaitanya, speaking from the Vedas, love of Godhead is so exalted that it is considered to be the fifth goal of human life. The Vedas are Arta, Dharma, Kama, Moksha. The Vedas deal with Arta, money, Kama, sense gratification, uh, Dharma, religiosity, and Moksha, liberation. Those are the four goals of the Vedas, but they don't address themselves directly to the soul. They don't have the power to free you from the perpetual struggle for material existence, nor do they connect you directly with the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the fifth goal, which Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes as love of God, will accomplish all of that, what the Vedas themselves don't accomplish or at least what the indirect method of studying Vedanta does in comedy. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continues here. By awakening one's love of Godhead, one can attain the platform of conjugal love, tasting it even during the present span of life. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Karanai Shravanadi Sudha Chitti Kari We are all constitutionally and internally the eternal servants of Krishna, and that dormant love of God arises like the sun arises from the eastern sky through the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Therefore, there is no other method of uh, Vedic perfection than simply chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. But that does not mean one should not be philosophically inclined. So again, based on the Vedas, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continues here. The Supreme Lord, who is greater than the greatest, becomes submissive even to a very insignificant devotee because of his devotional service. It is the beautiful and exalted nature of devotional service that the infinite Lord, please understand this, it'll blow your mind. The infinite Lord becomes submissive to the infinitesimal living entity because of devotional service. The unconquerable Lord who creates millions and millions of universes out of fear of whom the sun rises and sets, the planets course on their orbits, the seasons change. The unconquerable Lord who defeated Kamsa, Haranyakashipu, Hiranyaksha, Sisupal, that unconquerable Lord is conquered, the infinite Lord is conquered 
by the devotional service that you, the infinitesimal living entity, can perform. Is there a greater wonder? Is there a greater wonder? And can there any, be any other occupation of the soul which compares to performing devotional service by which the unconquerable Lord becomes conquered? No wonder, it's not a surprise then, that after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu lay, rolls out, and again, go to Adi Lila, uh, seventh chapter, verses 140 or so, if you like to get all the verses that Lord Chaitanya Maharaj quoted. So is it any wonder then, the result of what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, it said from Adi Lila, verse 179, chapter seven, from that moment, when the Mayavadi philosophers heard the explanation of Vedanta Sutra from the Lord, their minds changed, and on the instruction of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they too chanted, Krishna, 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 always. So, can you imagine, after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's, before Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came, Banaras was a stronghold of impersonal philosophy. People stayed shut up in their ashrams, in their schools, uh, and they just studied, 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 and they spoke dry philosophy. After Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's short visit of a few weeks, the whole place of Benares, you can imagine, just exploded everywhere in all the streets and towns. All these 10,000 disciples of Prakasananda Saraswati, while not abandoning their uh, studies, their studies are now fueling the flame of their undivided, uninterrupted, unmixed devotional service to the Lord. So the whole city of Bharatas now is resounding with the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare. And this is the essence. Dharma projito kaitavo tra nematsarano satam vejam vashtam atravastam shivadam tapatrayon malinam Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Kimbara Parishaha Sadyo Ridi Avarudite Tra Kudibisha Shubihisharat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated, this Bhagavat Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth, Param Satyam Dimahi, is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all, such truth uproots the threefold miseries. The beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the Sayas Vyasadeva is sufficient in itself for God-realization. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within the heart. And Prabhupada says here, any process of religiosity which is based on the coverings of the body or the mind, gross or subtle, is sense gratification and it must be considered as a pretentious religion because it is unable to give protection and ultimate liberation to the devotees. This verse starts with the word prajita. Pra means complete and ujita means rejection. So from the beginning of the Bhagavatam, which is Vyasadeva's mature commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, which is his commentary on the Vedas, he says that they are kicking out any process of religion which is not directly related to the soul. Obviously, as we've discussed many times in these previous classes, the activities of the fruitive worker are gross sense gratification geared towards stimulating, touching, seeing, tasting, smelling. These are the gross senses that pertain to the gross body made of earth, air, fire, water, uh, and so on. However, there's also a subtle form of sense gratification relating to the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego, and that is called jnana yoga, or mental speculation. So Prabhupada declares here that all such pretentious religiosity based on gross or subtle speculation is completely rejected in the process of Bhagavad Dharma or the transcendental religion that is the eternal function of the living being. 
In the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, 111, pure devotional service, Bhakti Yoga, purely performed is defined in this way. Anyabilasita sunyam, it means it's pure devotion, pure bhakti, is kicking out fruit of work for the stimulation of the physical body and the extensions of this body, but it is also kicking out jnana yoga, which is based on mental speculation and which is not found in the Vedic truth, the essence of the Vedas, which means to lead you to undivided devotional service. So anyabilasita sunyam, sunyam means zero, so pure bhakti makes of fruit of work and mental speculation zero. There is no place, there is no portion of bhakti which accommodates fruit of work or mental speculation. Bhakti is Krishna yoga. It's not karma yoga or jnana yoga. It is Krishna yoga. That means your karma, the things that you do, even in terms of vocation, career, work, you do them in such a way that Krishna or God is honored. You don't just do them selfless, self, selflessly. You certainly don't do them selfishly, but you don't do them selflessly either. You do them with the pleasure of Krishna in mind. And that's how you take uh, karma and you make it bhakti. And also, so far, your intellect and your mind is concerned. You use it in order to comb the scriptures, and find the direct interpretation, the direct path back to home, back to God. Therefore, Rupa Goswami is defining pure bhakti as that, those activities which, in which the, the fruit of work mentality and the mental speculation mentality are reduced to sunyam, to nil. Anu krishnena silanam bhakti rudama. In other words, anything which is not specifically geared for the pleasure of Krishna, has no place in the execution of pure devotional service. Prabhupada says, regarding the fruit of workers and regarding the mental speculator, the first and foremost concern of fruit of workers, elevationists, empiric philosophers, and speculators is to raise their material position. And this is the fault. This is the fault anything that's not pure devotional service. What they're trying to do through mental speculation, fruit of work, is improve their position in the prison house. Isn't it? In the eighth chapter, Abrahma Bhubanaloka Panaraviti Mama Peti Purnarjanma, from the highest planet of Lord Brahm to the lowest planet, they're all places of misery where repeated birth and death take place. If you want to improve your situation within the material world, you're just trying for a better slot in the prison house. Let's say you're in a solitary confinement eating bread and water. And, and so you try to act or comport yourself in such a way that you get, instead of a class C situation in the prison house, that you go from a class C to a class B, or maybe even you dream of having a class A position in the prison house where your cell has curtains and TV and you get a cupcake every third day. <laughs> but that's not going to solve what Prabhupada started out by saying the perpetual struggle for existence in this material world. We need to solve in this human form of life for once and for all the birth, death, disease, and old age problem. If you don't use the days, the minutes, the hours, the weeks, and the months in this human form of life, limited as they are, for putting an end once and for all to birth, death, disease, and old age, then those areas and categories of activities, they're thrown out. They're rejected by such great saints as Sudha Goswami and Srila Rupa Goswami. Prabhupada continues here. But devotees of God have, have no such selfish desires to elevate within the prison house. They serve the Lord only, and they don't even want salvation. They don't even do what they do because they want salvation. They serve because they don't want to get out of the prison house without service to the Lord, they, without 
attaching themselves to the lotus feet of the Lord. So they serve the Lord only for his satisfaction. Sri Arjuna wanting to satisfy his senses by becoming a so-called nonviolent, pious man at first decided not to fight. Isn't it? Right in the beginning, setting the scene, first chapter, evam ukpa rishikesham godakesha parantama najotsa iti govina ukpatushnam bahuvaha. Having seen his friends and relatives and calculated, I don't know how this will benefit me to combat those who are my cousin, brothers, and my teachers. Having made that determination, what did Arjuna do? Ukpatushnam bahuvaha. He said, I will not fight, and then he shut his mouth. But that was not the end of it. Krishna loved Arjuna too much to leave him there in a mixed devotional service. <laughs> he, Prabhupada said he wanted to satisfy his sense of becoming by becoming a so-called nonviolent and pious man, and at first decided not to fight. And I don't see how any good can come to me or my family members by fighting my relatives here. Prabhupada continues, but when he was fully situated after the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita, which Krishna poured into him, reminding him basically that it's not about you. It's not about you. We can't calculate our pluses and minus, our gains or loss, based on my tiny little pinpoint of perspective and my senses which are defective in terms of making mistakes or losing, cheating, and being subject and being imperfect. So, after the 700 verses, after Krishna poured in each and every verse, each and every line, perfect, illuminating, clarifying, elevating, it's as if Arjuna was taken from being uh, encased in clouds and darkness and fog and throughout the 700 verses, now he's, now he's on the sun. Now he gets the God perspective, you see. Beginning, he had his own little tiny considerations, but after Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, then this is what Arjuna said. And these are, even from a point of view of anumata poeticism, these are some of the most powerful words in all of the Bhagavad Gita. Imagine, Krishna's just laid it all out for Arjuna, the bigger picture, presented everything in terms of pure devotional service without any consideration of selfishness or mental speculation. And once Arjuna gets it, nashta moha shmitir labda tat prasadam maya chuta Stito shmin gata sandeha krishase vachanam tava. Krishna is nashta My illusion, my self centeredness is now finished. Shmitir labda. And my memory is now regained that who am I? I am not a Pandava. I am not the husband of Subhadra and Draupadi. I'm not the brother ultimately of Yudhisthira, but I am Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema. Beyond the mind, the mental concoctions and the material designations and beyond the body, I am an eternal part and parcel servant of Krishna. And hearing from you has re reminded me of who I really am. Taught Prashadam Maya by your mercy. Now the illusion is finished. Shtito Shmin get the Sunday. Now I'm not wavering. I'm not tossed here and there by the chanchala, by the flickering mind, by the manoratina, by the chair to the mind. But now, due to your mercy, I am Shtito Shmin. I am firmly fixed. Kadishe Vachanam Tava. And I'm ready to act according to your instructions. Wow. If Krishna took the time to pour into and to nourish and cultivate his loving friend Arjuna and make sure that he had all the tools available to make the right decision, Arjuna certainly must have gratified Krishna by his unequivocal <laughs> statement of commitment now to following Krishna's orders and to carrying forward with the battle of Kurukshetra. 
<laughs> Prabhupada says here, it is the constitutional position of the living entity to be situated in pure bhakti, pure devotional service. Any so-called religious process that interferes with this unadulterated spiritual position of the living being must therefore be considered a pretentious process of religiosity. By contact with material nature, the living entities exhibit varied symptoms of the disease of material consciousness. To cure this material disease is the supreme object of human life. The process that treats the disease is called Bhagavad Dharma or Sanatan Dharma, real religion, which is described in the spotless Purana in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We are all pure spirit souls, parts and parcels of Krishna, at least in embryonic form, we're created as Krishna conscious living beings. At some or other, and that'll be a topic for another day, we as pure spirit souls fell into this material atmosphere. This material atmosphere is phenomenal and noumenal. It is physical, uh, earth, air, fire, water, and ether, and it is noumenal mind, intelligence, and false ego. So just like a pure drop of rainwater, as soon as it hits the earth, it becomes muddy. Its pure, pristine quality becomes tainted by contact with the earth. Similarly, our pure spiritual selves, when we descended into material atmosphere, we became tainted by contact with the physical element, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. But we must not also forget that we, we were, in addition, we were tainted by the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego as well. So not only fruitive work is pretentious, external to the self, but mental speculation is also external to the self and pretentious. It is subtle sense gratification as opposed to gross sense gratification. Now beyond the various forms of sense gratification uh, with which the living entity gets entangled and tainted in this material world, there is like a shining sun above the clouds, above the darkness of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhagavat Purana is the light by which people will get liberation in this age of Kali. Above the phenomenal and the noumenal, above the gross and subtle in, uh, snares of sense gratification, there is the Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is called saram. This is the essence. Just like you have milk. So the essence of milk is cream. That's the most important. Because cream contains all the palatable elements of milk itself. Similarly, the Srimad Bhagavatam contains, probably says, all the palatable and instructive and authentic versions of the different activities of the Lord and his devotees. Now, simply on the basis of reading and reciting and discussing the Srimad Bhagavatam, one can be elevated to the highest position of transcendence. Anarto Pashyamam Shakshan, the fruitive, the phenomenal, as well as the noumenal, any unwanted anarthas, anything which does not uh, catalyze, but rather impedes our process back to that stature of pure devotional service, that is eliminated in the process of uh, repeating and hearing and reciting on a daily basis the Srimad Bhagavatam. Anarto Pashramam Shakshad, the, the miseries of the living being which are external to him can be directly mitigated, bhakti yoga madokshaja, logas ajanato vidvams, by the linking process of devotional service, chakra sattva desamitam. But the mass of people do not know this, and therefore the learned Vyasa compiled the Vedic literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is in relationship to the absolute truth. And one last example before we wind up here this Wednesday morning is that of uh, Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj was a fruitive worker par excellence. Dhruva Maharaj, he wasn't on the level of a mental speculator. After all, he was only a five-year-old boy. He got insulted by being prohibited from climbing up under the lap of his father. He realized that he was being cheated of his rightful kingdom. He was full of anger. He was full of self-righteousness. And he undertook a process of austerities to get his kingdom 
back. In fact, to get his kingdom back several times over. So he fulfills the definition of the grossest level of endeavor. I mean, he can't be blamed. I mean, what else do you expect of a five-year-old boy? The urges and impulses of a five-year-old boy are very elemental. And so Dhruva Maharaj, he wanted everything. He wanted it all. Wealth, women, fame, followers, land, everything. He was on a very gross level. However, as a result of his performing mixed devotional service, the Lord very kindly appeared before Dhruva Maharaj. And when the Lord initially appeared before Dhruva Maharaj, he was very embarrassed. He was very uh, uncomfortable. The Supreme Lord with forearms, dazzling effulgent, magisterial. Here's a five-year-old boy who just wanted stuff. He felt crude and rough and embarrassed and uncultured and immature in front of Lord Vishnu. And you can imagine he was kind of uh, looking a little bit downcast and making circles in the earth there with his foot. And then, very mercifully, the Lord touched Dhruva's head with his concha and brought about a total transformation. Um, what was the Yohanta Pravisha Mama Vachami Mampachotum Samjayavati Sanjivayati Akili Shakta Shadamana Anyamsta Hasta Charana Shadam Pranam Namo Bhagate Purushaya Tubyam. That touch of the Lord, Sparsha, enacted a total transformation in the body of Dhruva Maharaj. He said, it is as if I had been sleepwalking. Is that it? As if I was a body somehow moving. And now all my senses have awakened. Smelling, seeing, hearing, touching, and especially vacham, my power of speech. So it was as if Dhruva Maharaj had lived his whole life sleepwalking, unconscious to the potential and the power of the awakened senses in the service of the Lord. So there's definitely before and after. Prabhupada says here, but Dhruva's condition before and after attaining spiritual realization and seeing the Supreme Personality of God face to face, he could understand now that his life force and activities had been sleeping. And Prabhupada says here, unless you come to the position of pure Krishna consciousness, pure unalloyed bhakti, untainted by fruit of work or mental speculation, it is said you are understood to be sleeping, unconscious. Unless one is spiritually situated, all his activities are taken as a dead man's activities or as ghostly activities. To this effect, there was a song by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. It says, O oh, living entity, get up. How long will you sleep on the lap of the witch of Maya? Now you have the opportunity of possessing a human form of body. Now try to get up, awaken, and realize yourself. And the Vedas also declare, get up, get up. You have the opportunity, you have the boon of the human form of life. Now realize yourself. These are the Vedic injunctions and bona fide practicing Vaishnavas and Acharyas do not ignore or neglect the Vedic injunctions. They simply do not see the Vedas as all in all, but they study the Vedas to bring out Krishna. Just like you turn milk to bring out the cream. Just like Vyasadeva wrote the four Vedas dealing with Arta, Kama, Dhamma, Muksha, but then the mature fruit, the final commentary on the Vedas was the cream like Saram essence, Srimad Bhagavatam. We'll finish here with this paragraph by Srila Prabhupada. Humanity must have food for the mind and ear as well as for the purpose of speaking. As far as transcendental vibrations are concerned, the essence of all Vedic knowledge is the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. 
in Kali Yuga, if this Vedic Maha Mantra is chanted regularly and heard regularly by the devotional process of Shravanam Kirtan, it will purify all societies and thus humanity will be happy both materially and spiritually. Thanks for being with us, Sindhu, Girish, Eugene. I, don't, I can't scroll here, but I've certainly enjoyed sharing with you, and I'm very appreciative of your taking the time to be with me here this Wednesday morning. We come at 7.30, Mountain Daylight Time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to have Bhagavatam classes. We also have... Um, what we call seeker-friendly talks, which are live on Facebook on uh, Saturdays at 7 o'clock and on Sundays at 5.30 p.m. And also Sunday morning, we have the um, Krishna Light Show with some rap songs and the stories of how Bhai Bobby and I got involved in Krishna consciousness in Australia. So you're welcome to join us on any and all of those levels. In the meantime, I'll bid you adieu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.